Gabriel pulled himself off the operating table, sitting on his edge. He tapped where the doctor had worked and could feel the improvement. Where once the break was detectable, he would have bent over in pain. Now there was only a slight bump where the crack once was, and only a dull ache remained. I think you'll find I'm very good at my job, the surgeon said, sending all of his tools away for disposal or cleaning. I was not doubting you, merely feeling the difference for myself, Gabriel replied, removing his hand from the injury. Got to love bone cement and nanomedicine, he added. I can't help but agree, the surgeon said, turning to face him. His surgeon was a holoterec, whose name had turned out to be an unpronounceable combination of gurgles and croaks. They had not been surprised, and the translator he used said, Call me Bob. Their species was well known to Gabriel. They were deaf orders too, a race of semi-aquatic people from the world of Doltru. He stood roughly 1.5 metres tall. Their body was a trunk-like structure supported on six fleshy legs spread evenly around the base. One would be mistaken for thinking that the Holotruk were a species based on radial symmetry, but this was quickly dismissed when one noticed that their eyes were positioned on only one side of the body. Bob's six arms were arranged in pairs, running from top to bottom. Each one was a remarkably dexterous limb. Each end was covered in thousands of fine mobile, cilla-like structures, incapable of fine motor control a human could only dream of. All ten of his eyes were focused on Gabriel now. I will say, it is rather refreshing to talk to some with the suit off for a change, said Gabriel. Well, you'll get plenty of opportunities because I want you to spend the next two days in Death Ward, replied Bob. Death Ward? asked Gabriel, not frightened by the name, just surprised at the sheer unoriginality of it. If you've got a problem, bring it out with the administrators. It may be lacking in taste, but it gets the point across, responded Bob. They had had this conversation dozens of times, and had long ago gotten used to it. That aside, I just want to monitor you in case some other deeper damage has been done. I don't expect any, but better safe than sorry, they explained, bringing the conversation back to the original topic. You'll want to put your suit on, explained Bob as Gabriel got to his feet. Why? It's a Death World Award, stated Gabriel. True, but a lot of the nurses and porters aren't. Not many of us are willing to go through the rigmarole of working here, explained Bob. So, for their sake, wear your suit. You just said I would get plenty, Gabriel protested, but Bob cut him off. I said you would get plenty of opportunities. There is a common room, showers and other facilities in the ward, but the beds and whatnot are all in an area Paradise Worlders can enter, so I repeat, wear the suit. Gabriel raised his hands and replied, fine, you've made your point. Climbing into the outfit like you would a pair of overalls, Gabriel winced as his bruises and torn muscles complained. The treatment had done much to improve them, but medical science had done all it could. All that was left was to let time take its course. A nurse arrived with a wheelchair, but Gabriel preferred to walk. As he left, he turned and said, Before I leave, I've got to ask. The name? replied Bob. The name, said Gabriel. I studied at Cambridge, explained Bob. I recommend bed rest and no excitement for a few days, the doctor explained. Pierced at having taken to the hospital, and after ten hours of waiting, they had finally been seen. It had been rather annoying to be kept here for that long, but Nish accepted that there were other people with more serious concerns. Pista, for her part, had recovered remarkably quickly, seemingly forgetting that she had nearly been something's dinner. She reveled in the attention, and Nish knew it would go to her head. As she left the doctor's office and headed for the exit, Nish realised that the human was here too. She had seen the ambulance when she had been at A&E. Nish felt that the meagre thank you she had given him was hardly enough. Approaching the reception desk and stilling her nerves, she asked, Excuse me, a human was admitted to this hospital. May I ask which ward they are in? Are you a friend? asked the receptionist, looking up from her terminal screen. No, but they saved my daughter's life, and I feel it would be appropriate to thank them in person, Nish explained. The alien looked at Nish and her daughter. They had heard of what occurred at the zoo, and a human and a Tafunda had been involved. Normally we would not allow it, but considering the unusual circumstances, I can contact the ward he's on, and they can ask him if we would like a visit, the administrator explained. Yes, please, replied Nish, relieved that she had not been rejected outright. Ah, the man of the hour himself, someone said, as Gabriel limped into the ward. Turning to his right was a ponoclid, or a ponoclid. Gabriel wasn't sure what the correct pronunciation was. 
They were a reptilian race, bipedal, standing on digitigrade legs with harsh angular scales covering their bodies. Their face was long, robust and filled with sharp teeth. They were partially hidden behind a mask covering her nose, mouth and eyes. Gabriel knew the Pollock Clint was a she because of the lack of crests above the eyes and the absence of a dew claw on the leg. And it was leg because the other one was currently in the cast. What happened? asked Gabriel, very confused by what she meant. It's you, the man who jumped into the Caladon pen to save that kid, she replied, waving her PDA over her head. How did you know that? he asked. Her answer had not really told him anything. The woman whistled and explained. Over 30 people are recording you, bro. You're trending hard. Just about everyone on the planet has seen it. Look, 3 million views in less than a day, and rising. The Pornock Clint waved her PDA at him, and Gabriel limped over to see for himself. To Gabriel's utter horror, she was correct. The woman hit play, and he saw himself swing the Ventura over his head and down onto the log. Turn it off, Gabriel demanded, turning away from the screen. Ah, uh, camera shy. The woman replied, end of humour in her voice, but she did turn it off and put her PDA away. It'll be on the news soon, probably have reporters and paparazzi stationed outside the hospital in less than a day, she added. Gabriel clutched his head in his hands and squatted on the ground, ignoring the way his legs and ribs complained. The Pernod Clid relaxed her face and her tone became serious. It was very brave. I don't know if I would have had it in me to confront that thing. Gabriel did not respond. He simply walked to the bed opposite them and laid upon it. You okay? The Pernod Clint asked. Tired, replied Gabriel, resting his head on the pillow. I'm Erolua, by the way, the woman said. Gabriel, he responded flatly. A few moments of silence passed before Erolua said, I know you people are tough and all, but that Conodon should have crushed you like a breast, suit or no suit. I mean, it's not exactly power armour. She gave him a few seconds, but when Gabriel did not respond, Erolua said, I guess you're enhanced in some way. The only question is, cybernetics or biomechanics? Biomechanics. My bones were reinforced with ceramics when I was a kid, plus all the standard ones like cancer resistance and immune boosters, Gabriel replied. He wasn't really sure why he was telling her this, but Gabriel supposed it was because, when he was doing so, he wasn't thinking about what had happened at the zoo. Fancy, Erolua stated, a more playful tone returning. Not really. Pretty much every human is genetically enhanced in some way. Only a few purists refuse to have any at all. There's also the life and health span extensions that I'm sure you have as well, Gabriel replied, looking at her. You already know about me, Miss Irelor. What are you in for? asked Gabriel. She waved her hands over her cask, and Gabriel responded, I got that part, but how did it happen? Nothing quite as remarkable as you. I jumped off a wall that was a little too high, explained Irelor. Jumped off, not fell off? said Gabriel, raising one eyebrow. I did it to impress Anatulana, Erola replied, scratching one side of her face with her retractable claws. Preemptively responding to Gabriel's next question, she explained, In my defense, she is so freaking hot. She's got this short face and her scales are so smooth. It drives me wild. I mean, I know the old trope about aliens just being pornoclid with different skin tones and weird bits in their faces, but my god do my people get lucky, she added, stroking her own arms. You're telling me you nearly killed yourself just trying to impress a girl? Asked Gabriel, his mind still struggling to process this. Nothing about tried. It worked, stated Erolor, looking directly at him. What do you mean it worked? Questioned Gabriel, sitting up. She visits me every day, and I've got a date when I'm released, Erolor retorted, clicking her tongue as she did so. Gabriel tried his best to rub his eyes through the suit. Don't give me that. Have you seen the Etulana? It's an entire race of babes. I mean, I've got no sexual or romantic interest in men, but even I find the Atlanta guys attractive. They're all just so feminine, Erolo explained, with a wave of her hand and a glint in her eye. With that, Gabriel let out a slight chuckle. This wound might have been about as subtle as a brick, but her balanced enthusiasm was pleasant. As his mood was on the up, a nurse entered the ward, another Halotarak. Gabriel, uh, Nish and her daughter would like to visit you. Would you like to see them? They asked. 